Please be seated. Kids, you can be dismissed for junior church. Well, we are continuing through our series in 1 John, and we've been looking at how do we have true fellowship with God and one another. Last week, we focused on John's words of assurance to Christians that uh, are intended to change the way that we love, uh, what we love. And uh, this week, we're hearing John's warning against what could lead us astray from, from the Lord. So we come to 1 John 2, 18 through 28. The Apostle John writes to the churches, Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth." Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? That is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father." And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you received from him abides in you. And you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. Let us pray for these words. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your holy, inspired, and errant word. Again, we thank you for your servant, the Apostle John, whom you communicated your word through. And so, Lord, may we receive it as God's holy word, the very breathed out words of God given to us. Open our hearts and our minds to all that you would have for us this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning we are talking about growing in fellowship with God by staying clear of antichrists. Now, I imagine that is not something that most of us think about on a day-to-day basis. I don't usually think about antichrists. But here in our text, the Apostle John, under divine inspiration, sees antichrists as a real, everyday threat to Christian fellowship with God and with one another. And so if we're going to be faithful, biblical Christians, if we have a desire at all to grow in fellowship with God and by extension fellow believers, then we must adopt the Apostle John's worldview as God's truth. Truth that both protects us and truth that will lead us into deeper fellowship with God. And so this morning we're going to look at what does it look like to stay clear of Antichrist? What does John say to the church about this? And we're going to see three basic moves. First, acknowledging Antichrist, then being assured of who we are in Christ, and then finally abiding in Christ. And so we begin acknowledging Antichrist. 
In verses 18 and 19, John acknowledges that there are antichrists living among the Christians in the world. And so he begins in verse 18. He says, children, it is the last hour. Now again, we don't want to miss how John addresses the church. He once again, as he's done many times in the letter, calls the churches that he is writing to children. And we've said before, he's not doing this to speak down to them, but he is a spiritual father, sees them as his beloved children, his, their spiritual children, and of course, because in Christ they are beloved children of God. We should always receive God's word with that mindset that we are being seen as beloved children of God. And so uh, with a fatherly spirit, we're, we're being given this uh, word. And so to the beloved children, John says, it's the last hour. Now, what's he talking about with the last hour? If you remember from last week, and I'm sure you do, uh, we ended in verse 17, and the, the phrase that John said when he said, don't love the world, why? Because the world is passing away. Now in verse 18, John confirms to Christians that they're living in the last hour. The world is passing away. The, the last hour is the time before Christ will return and usher in the new heavens and the new earth. Today we would simply say we're living in the end times. Now, why does the last hour matter? Well, because in the last hour of God's salvation story, there are appearing and will appear many who oppose Christ Jesus uh, as, the, as the Messiah. And thus Christians need to acknowledge and be aware of such people and to guard against such people. And so he says in the rest of verse 18, as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. Notice that John first acknowledges what Christians had been hearing in his day. It's very similar to what Christians in our day hear. And that is that there is a future Antichrist to come. The Antichrist is coming, and it's a very future orientation. And just like in our day, uh, John had Christians who were thinking about this future Antichrist. And today we might say they were thinking about it like the final boss of a video game. You know, there's like little enemies, and then there's the really big guy, and that's who you need to be worried about and focused on how are we going to defeat that Antichrist. But notice in our text that John actually shifts the church's view from the future of this unknown Antichrist to come. He doesn't say that it doesn't exist. He just shifts their attention from the future last boss to the Antichrist that are among them now. And he, he acknowledges, he says, so many Antichrists have come. Now, he's writing this, I don't know, 60, 70 AD, and he's already saying Antichrists have come come. So they're, they're living in a world where there are antichrists among them. And he says this confirms that we are actually living in the end times, the last hour. So his point, don't focus so much on the future antichrist. Focus on those who are opposed to Jesus now. Opposed to Jesus as the Christ now. And, and, and where should Christians put their focus? Where, where should they look for such antichrists? Look at verse 19, the beginning of it. They went out from us. John's, John says those who are opposing Christ, belittling Christ, minimizing who he is, what the scriptures say about him, what the apostles witness about him, they went out from us. That is, they came out of the church. I don't miss this. It's very sobering. Well, we as Christians, we tend to be concerned with the enemy out there. You know, outside the church, you know, the terrorists, the totalitarian government, the foreign invaders, whoever your boogeyman is, it's out there. We think, oh, that's, that's the cause. We got to wall the city in. But John says, man, look in here. Look in here. Look in the community. It's, it's often those who gathered among Christians who are not believers themselves but gathered among them 
and, and left the church, who then, after leaving, are trying to lead other Christians astray. To say, I've discovered something new, or I discovered it's really not what the church is teaching you. It's, that's not who really Jesus is. And, and so they're speaking about and opposing Jesus and believing, and John says that they come, they come right out of the church. Uh, look at John, John 19. John does make it clear that such people were not truly saved, we might say, truly Christians. He says, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. The, the hallmark of a, of a truly saved Christian is that they will continue with the body of Christ. They, they will continue under the authority of the apostolic teaching, which we have in the New Testament. They will continue in the gospel. And John says they did, they did not. These folks did not. They left us at some point. And so John says they would have continued in fellowship with us, that's the uh, apostles, and by extension, the faithful church, had they were saved, but they, but they were not. Which then would raise the question in anyone's mind, and particularly Christians in his day, well, why, why did God allow them to gather with us and then leave? The rest of verse 19, but they went out that it might become plain that they were, that they all are not of us. What John is saying is sometimes God prunes his church and makes that visible. Uh, he is assuring them that always Jesus knows who are his, but sometimes God makes it clear who, who belongs to him and who, who doesn't so, so that his church can see and acknowledge those who are truly for Christ, pursuing Christ, submitting their lives to Christ, and those whose hearts are actually against Christ. And so to begin with, we want to ask, what about us? The first question we want to ask ourselves is, you know, will I believe John's words and believe that these apply for today and believe that there are antichrists today, now, and not just in the future? And do I take... Seriously, the sobering truth that Antichrist can come within the church rather than from outside the church. If I take that seriously, that will probably change the way I look at discipleship, worship, pray for ourselves and for others. Uh, how I go about discipling my kids, or other Christians God has put in my life and encouraging them. If you just think about, well, how does, that, how does that change the way that we pray for ourselves or pray for even those who we deeply love that may themselves have left the church and maybe they still identify as Christians. They're not opposed to Jesus. They're not in the Antichrist category, but we look at their lives of people we deeply love, friends and family, and we say they're they're susceptible to such false teaching. They're susceptible to those narratives that are coming from people outside of the church that will lead them away from fellowship with God and fellowship with one another. How do we, how do we pray for them? And how do we pray for ourselves? Well, if that is our concern, if we desire for ourselves not to be led astray, if we desire to help others not be led astray, if we want to know how to pray for others, John has some good news for us. Uh, because that is John's pastoral heart as well. And so he gives us step two of staying clear of Antichrist. And that is assurance. Uh, being assured. Uh, being assured. In verse 20 through 23, John assures true Christians, of who they are in Christ, showing them how they are very different than Antichrist, and basically kind of the two different uh, roads or options or ways uh, that are presented before them. So in verse 20, in contrast to Antichrist, John says to the church, to those who are gathered in the name of Jesus Christ, he says, but you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you have all knowledge. 
Now, again, the you there are those who are not only showing up on a Sunday, (laughs) but, but those who have repented of their sins, put their faith in Jesus, and confessing him as the Christ, the the Messiah. They they have bowed their knee to Jesus. He says, you, you, the church in the name of Jesus, have been anointed by the Holy One. The Holy One there is Jesus. And then anointing is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And and he says, because uh, you have been anointed with the Holy Spirit, you have knowledge. And some of your Bible translations might say truth there. You have truth which John expounds on in the next church to get the next verse to encourage the church verse 21 he says i write to you not because you do not know the truth but because you know it and because no lie is is of the truth see john knows that there's there are believers who are going to be tempted by knowledge that comes outside the church maybe yeah i think about it in even our day you might hear Someone who said, oh, I attended church for a while, but then I saw this and that that was wrong with it. And all of a sudden, they're not walking with Jesus anymore. It was very popular for a while to have deconversion stories or deconstruction stories where I deconstructed my faith and I found there's not anything really there. And so whatever I think about Jesus, it's not really much and it's not biblical at all. John knows we can hear those. And there's something maybe tempted about, well, maybe they understand something I don't know. Maybe there's some knowledge there that I don't know or some truth there. Maybe they've really discovered something. And John remembers, no, listen, think about who you are in Christ. Think about what Christ has given to you. You, Christian, have been anointed by Jesus with the Holy Spirit. Thus you have the truth. Not because you can discover it all on your own, but what Jesus taught his disciples in John 16, 13. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. John teaches and goes on to teach that no lies of the truth, that is the Holy Spirit who leads us in truth, does not breed lies. And so Christ, what John is saying is, Christ Jesus has given you his people something that no one else can give you. He he has given you the Holy Spirit that always leads you and will always lead you to truth and not to lies. That is not the case with those who oppose Jesus. And John makes this very clear in verse 22. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. So in contrast to the Holy Spirit who who leads us into truth, John is saying all antichrists are liars. They might not know they're lying, but they are speaking lies because they are denying the truth that Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Messiah. In in John's day, the the heresy that he's directly uh, addressing for his people is, is that people were denying the incarnation of Jesus. That is, they denied that that God became man in the person of Jesus Christ. And so in doing so, they denied that Jesus was sort of qualified to even be Christ. We'll see John address this more directly in 1 John 4, uh, verse 2 and 3. He says, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and is now in the world today. That's how, who John has in mind when he's speaking about Antichrist among them. It's people who, who deny something essential uh, uh, of Jesus. And so today, we have people who say, oh, I like Jesus' moral teaching, but they don't see him as divine, definitely not the son of God. They don't see him as God incarnate in the flesh. John would say, we love you, but you're walking in the spirit of the Antichrist. You're lying about who Jesus is, whether you know it or not. You do not have true fellowship with God and, and, and one another. And there are all kinds of ways that people tr- try to diminish who Jesus was, 
And so they are not confessing uh, the biblical view, God's revelation of who Jesus is. And so John makes it clear that such people, when they deny Jesus is the Christ, they also are denying the Father and the Son. And so they have no fellowship with God the Father. And he repeats this and makes it clear in verse 23. No one who denies the Son has the Father. No one who denies the Son. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except for me. If you deny the Son, there is no access to God the Father. There is no access to the fellowship of God with now or in heaven to come. But John encourages the church in verse 23, whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. How do I know? I belong to God. I confess the Son. I believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I believe that he is God incarnate in the flesh. I believe he is what scripture says he is. This is why, you know, once a month when we take communion, we we say the Apostles' Creed. That's a confession that Christians have historically for 2,000 years been saying to say, I confess the Son, I confess who he is. Another common confession is the Nicene Creed that says who Jesus is. Because we recognize that to believe what the Bible reveals about Christ, to have faith in Christ, is how we also have access to the Father. It is how we have fellowship with with God. And so John is making the contrast very clear for the church. He says, the the way of the Antichrist will will separate you from the Father because they're denying the truth uh, of the Son. But the Christian who confesses the truth of Jesus has fellowship with with, with, with the Father. And so he, he wants to assure the church, he wants to assure them that they would not be attempted or feel led or feel like there's really anything worthy to follow, to say, no, no, God in Christ has already given me everything I need for perfect, growing, deeper fellowship with him. And so when we think about ourselves, how can we protect and pray for ourselves? How can we protect and pray for those who are vulnerable to being led astray? The first thing, the most important thing, is to see what Christ Jesus has given us. To see the assurances that we have in Christ Jesus. Starting with the Holy Spirit that he has given us to lead us into all truth. We believe that Jesus is the Christ. We believe that Jesus Christ has given us not just something, but someone, the third person of the Trinity. He has anointed us with his Holy Spirit, something far better than anyone outside the church could give you. He has given us the Holy Spirit who leads us into truth, who will never lie to us, who will never lead us astray, and will always lead us into deep fellowship with the Father and the Son. The Antichrist, by contrast, those who do not know Jesus, those who deny Jesus, who belittle him in any way, shape, or form, they will just enslave you with their lies, and they will lead you from fellowship with God, the Father, and the Son. And so let us pray for people. If they grew up in the church, maybe they're still believers. Pray that they would see what Christ Jesus has given them in the Holy Spirit. Pray for the truth to come to them that they would not be led astray. Pray that they would be drawn back into fellowship with Christ and the Father. And may that be our own hearts and desires is to be pray that we would follow the Holy Spirit, that we would see what Christ has given us and that we would not be tempted to go uh, looking for truth or knowledge or anything outside, outside the church when it comes to matters of faith. This is where John is leading us, leading us to seek such things so that we would have true fellowship with God, the Father, and through the Son, and so that we would not be led astray by Antichrist. And so he ends here in our text showing us that fellowship with God in Christ Jesus is really the ultimate antidote antidote to being carried away by antichrists. And so look at verses 24 through 28 with me. Uh, We come to abiding in Christ. 
In verses 24 through 25, John gives Christians the ultimate antidote to being led astray by Antichrist, and that is to abide in the real Christ. Abide in him. Now look at what he says in verses 24 through 25. He says, let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. So John is a leader of the church. In his pastoral heart, he gives a command, a loving command to the church. Abide in what you heard from the beginning. Now, what did they hear from the beginning? Well, we back back up to 1 John 1, 1 through 3. We will remember that John opened his letter to the churches in this way. He said, that which was from the beginning, which we, the apostles, have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our own hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifest to us. That which was from the beginning is the apostles' testimony of Jesus Christ. Their testimony of Jesus Christ, the resurrected Lord, the one who was raised from the dead, the one who is the word of life, the one who has authority to grant eternal life. And John, in love, commands the church to abide in that testimony, to abide in that gospel, good news, witness of Jesus that they've had from the beginning. He says, for in doing so, you will abide in the Father and in, or in the Son and in the Father. You will have fellowship with him. When you remain in that message, when you receive that message, when you continue to walk in that, live in that. And he, and he says in there, there is the promise that Jesus has made to the apostles, eternal, eternal life. In that gospel message is eternal life. Now, in the next verse, John makes it clear why he is writing to the churches and again commands them to abide in Christ. Look at verse 26 through 27. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you, but the anointing that you received from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything, and is true, and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. Now John's very clear about his concern for the people. He says, I'm writing to you about those who are trying to deceive you. People who are actively working to deceive you about who Jesus is, what he came to do, or in their minds didn't come to do. And John says, I'm, I'm writing to you. I'm concerned about this as I, as I look. And so John reminds them, remember the anointing that you received from Christ, that it abides in you. That is the Holy Spirit. He abides in you. If your faith is in Christ, Christ's Spirit abides in you. And that, the picture here, just to kind of drill down on this a little moment, when he's using this word abide, it's a picture that Christ's Spirit has taken up home in your spirit, Christ's spirit has moved in. He's going to rearrange the furniture. That's the picture. He has made his home in you. That's assurance. Now John concludes, just as his anointing has taught you, abide in him. What is the chief role, desire of the Holy Spirit? To draw you to Christ. To lead you to Christ. Where the Holy Spirit, when you open the word of God, what is he going to teach you fundamentally? Everything that points you to abiding with Christ. The Holy Spirit is always drawing us to Christ because in Christ we are drawn to the Father. And so John says, listen, just as his anointing has taught you, abide in him. Abide in Christ. Now we might wonder, how does one abide with Christ? How do we remain, live with, make our home with Christ? Well, there are many examples in the Bible, but a few general examples. 
Stay close to Christ. Build your life on him. Learn his teaching. Pray to him and through him often. Ask the Holy Spirit to teach you about Jesus as you're reading the Bible. Holy Spirit, show me, how does this apply to Christ, what I'm reading, and then through Christ to me? Gather with the body of Christ as often as you can. That counts. Get baptized. Receive communion when it's offered. And always, always, always soak in the word of God. Those are just some of the ways that scripture tells us about ways that we can abide in Christ and grow in fellowship with Christ. So the question is, how, how are we doing at that? How are you doing at that? How are you doing that with, at abiding in Christ this week, last week, or the last month, when you look at your days, are you, are you taking advantage of what God has given you? Are you abiding in Christ? Is it a priority for you? Or are you abiding in other things that lead you away from Christ? That is the struggle, isn't it? Day by day, hour by hour, especially in our entertainment world and we have so many activities that can fill the calendar and just other distractions and things to do let, let alone our own just flesh that sometimes doesn't want to that is that is the struggle that's why we need the grace of the holy spirit we need the word of god we need the help of god to say lord holy spirit draw me to christ Give me a desire for that, that I would abide in you, that I wouldn't be led astray. Uh, John knows that it is hard even in his day for Christians to prioritize Christ, and so he leaves them with one last encouragement. We could say of why it's so important to uh, abide and prioritize abiding in Christ. Then he does so with a, with a future orientation. Look at verse 28. And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. Again, notice John speaks to the church as little children. You can almost feel John's heart just ache for these Christians as, as he loves them with, with God's love for his, for his children. He sees what is good for them. And, and he just says, little children, those I love deeply, abide in Christ. Abide in Christ. Why? Why, would, why make that a party? So that when Christ appears at his second coming, you would have confidence. You would have confidence. I, I grew up in the age of a Left Behind series. And uh, in my high school years were right before the year 2000. So you remember those days? Everyone really thought that was the end of the world. And, um, and I, I, I remember like thinking about Christ's return and not being so happy about that, uh, being scared. That was kind of the narrative of like, oh, man, that sounds really bad. But you know what happens when we abide in Christ? And you, some of you really know this. The more you spend time with Christ, what happens? Your confidence grows. You're saying, come, Lord Jesus, come. You can't wait for that day. You can't wait for Jesus to come. You can't wait for your confidence grows more and more. And that is what John is putting, saying. He's saying, Christians, I want you to abide in Christ so that your heart would grow, so that you would be happy to see Jesus' return and you would want to run and meet him, fall at his feet and worship him and just say, my Savior has come. Praise the Lord. Confidence, confidence running to Christ. He says that is not so with those who will be led astray. Rather, the Antichrist, those who are led astray by them, when they see Jesus, they have the complete opposite reaction. They shrink from his coming. They want to hide. And you can read Revelation. This is poured out in more detail there. They hide from him and they have shame, shame at his coming. They see that they were wrong. They, they see that they went about the wrong way. And they have a complete opposite reaction. And so there are two opposite paths before us. Abiding in Christ, which leads to fellowship with God, 
the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, now and a joyful expectation of wonderful, deeper fellowship with Christ when he comes? Or being drawn away, following the spirit of the Antichrist and hiding from Christ in shame when he returns? And John doesn't want that for the church. None of us hopefully want that for the church. My heart for us is not that, right? We say, no, no, let it not be us. Instead, let us prepare for the greater fellowship to come. Let us now in our days, even if we stumble through them, even if some days are better than others or worse than others, still let us cultivate hearts that love Jesus. Let us follow his Holy Spirit. Let us pray that the Holy Spirit would lead us to Jesus and give us a desire to abide in him more and more, that our love for Christ would grow more and more, that we would know him more and more in his love for us, that we would grow in following the Holy Spirit as he guides us into truth and thus grow in fellowship with God and by extension, all fellow believers. When we do such things, the antichrists of the world have no power over the Christian who abides in Christ each day. It is the ultimate antidote to abide in Christ Jesus. And so this week, let us acknowledge that there are antichrists in the world around us today. But also let us be assured that you and I are not among them if we confess Christ, have received his Holy Spirit, are following the Holy Spirit in the in truth and seeing what Christ has given you and me let us abide with him in all the ways the Bible gives to us so that you and I would grow in deeper fellowship with God and look confidently with all true believers around the world past and present and future to Christ's glorious return and the fellowship we will have with him now and forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I do pray that you would open our eyes to the spirit of the age in this last hour, those antichrists among us. Just, Lord, that if there are influences or voices or whatever, wherever they may be, that we're listening to and letting into our lives that are not from you, that are drawing us away from fellowship with Christ. Lord, we thank you for what you have given us in and through Jesus Christ, salvation and the Holy Spirit to lead us in truth. And we pray that we would seek to follow the Holy Spirit's leading in everything that we do, that you would give us a love for truth, a love for Christ. Lord, help us in our weakness, in our distractions. Lord, we ask for your help by the power of the Holy Spirit to abide in Christ Jesus every day, each and every day. May we love the fellowship we have with you and by extension the fellowship we have with believers so that the future would not look dark. But when we think about our Savior's return, we would have great confidence in our hearts and look forward to that day with great joy and the fellowship to come. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.